we are live good evening everyone welcome back to our focus online lecture 295 and this is the ocular oncology session 2 and uh, we will continue the last uh, week's session with dr santosh hanavasa while he talks to us about management of ocular surface tumors and as i said that we wouldn't be wasting time on the introduction but because we would like to hear more of you sir so over to you sir thank you i had a few tumors left out before i could start the management these were vascular fibrous neural xanthomatous lymphoid and some secondary tumors now this is a list of vascular tumors that we have i'm not going to show you all of these but some of these if you have a patient like this coming to you in the clinic with large vascular channels on the ocular surface especially episcleral these are subconjunctival episcleral and there are some deep intrascleral channels as well then the first thing that you should uh, differentiate is between orbital varices and arteriovenous malformation there's a simple clinical test that you can do one is bend down test of course and the second is valsalva maneuver if valsalva is positive in these patients then you can fairly easily assume that this is orbital varices the epivalva component of orbital varices does not bleed much so you can attempt to excise these debulb these cauteries this or cryosis and that would be the management of choice but if it is arteriovenous malformation then you have to explore with an endovascular surgeon whether they could do a uh, endovascular procedure and block the feeder vessels if that is not possible you can cryo it or cauterize it with limited success if i have a patient with perilimbal 4 to 5 mm large slightly elevated lesion with large vascular channels then you would suspect that it is acquired conjunctival capillary hemangioma conjunctival capillary hemangioma or eyelid capillary hemangioma with conjunctival component is a common infantile problem it's called infantile capillary hemangioma but it can occur in interpalpebral bulba conjunctiva in adults looking exactly like this and if a patient is bothered about it or again because of its location if it forms delin and dry spots you can excise it so this is a patient who had a uh, past uh, history of thyroid eye disease and he had recurrent superior limbal keratoconjunctivitis and such patients can often develop these cherry red lesions which can be kind of having a small peduncle and are easily mobile over the corneal epithelial surface but are attached to epithelium at some point this is exuberant vascular vasculature or biogenic granuloma that can develop in any clinical setting and in this situation this presented in a patient with superior limbal keratoconjunctivitis now if you have patients of this sort large vascular channels of various configuration then these could nothing but uh, be abnormal arteriovenous communications on the epivalvular surface but sometimes you may have a surprising histopathological diagnosis histopathologically they may turn out to be capillary hemangioma whereas if you have larger vascular channels like this either attached to the lacrimal gland as you see here or in the epivalvular surface itself then that could be an acquired conjunctival cavernous hemangioma and the treatment of choice for these uh, lesions is excision biopsy if you have a patient who comes to you with subconjunctival hemorrhage and uh, that is happening on a uh, recurrent basis and when the hemorrhage resolves you find these small cystic lesions may not be as extensive as this maybe just one or two small cysts or this kind of an architecture wavy subconjunctival or intraconjunctival clear fluid filled channels this is called lymphangiectasia lymphangiectasia has a tendency to bleed spontaneously and you might find at the bed of a resolved subconjunctival hemorrhage and if that is happening recurrently then you can cryo it or excise it whereas this is a full blown case of conjunctival lymphangioma now orbital lymphangioma is what you have heard of but orbital lymphangioma can also have a conjunctival component they could also be an exclusive conjunctival lymphangioma which can have fornicial extension and this was one such case which was involving this is the uh, carinkle of course and that's the plica which is hypertrophic and it is all across the medial and the part of inferior fornix what gives away conjunctival lymphangioma as a clinical diagnosis is the blood vessels which have this kind of a vertical orientation it's called cox crew blood vessel now that looks very aggressive but that's again a patient with 
conjunctival lymphangioma. Somebody attempted a biopsy in this location and it bled extensively. So obviously it's a very vascular lesion, but conjunctival lymphangioma can be vascular sometimes. This is a very uh, benign variant of conjunctival lymphangioma, very silent lymphangioma that appears only when the patient looks laterally, it starts appearing from behind the carankle, behind the plica and uh, next right next lateral to the carankle. So this is a lymphangioma confined to the plica semilunaris of the conjunctiva, whereas this is a much extensive lymphangioma involving the entire ocular surface and also the lid margin. You can know not nodular excrescences at the lid margin and anterior lid surface as well. Some of these are clear cysts. That's conjunctival lymphangioma. So what if you have a patient like this with prior history of surgery, remote surgery done 20 years ago, suddenly a lesion pops up which bleeds on touch and has a lot of discharge then it could be exuberant granulation or pyogenic granuloma. You should always look for the base of it. Base of it may contain a suture. In this patient, there was a radial sponge that had tried to extrude after 20 long years. And that was the reason why this conjunctival uh, exuberant granulation or uh, uh, pyogenic granuloma occurred. And in fact, last time, I, I think I showed you a patient with lateral canthal pyogenic granuloma, which occurred for no reason at all. Now, if you have a young individual, who has a rapidly growing vascular lesion on the epibulbar surface. This patient was seen by another ophthalmologist just a week ago and he had noted the size of the lesion as 2 by 3 millimeter. Now in a week, it has grown to about 8 by 6 millimeter and it is elevated. Now it's produced subconjunctival hemorrhage as well. There are large vascular channels that are supplying it. And the only known malignancy which... Uh, multiplies by in days, not in weeks or months, is Kaposi sarcoma. You should always look for a history of HIV seropositivity in such patients. And this patient indeed turned out to be a patient of AIDS, which he was trying to hide during history taking, but it was Kaposi sarcoma of the conjunctiva. Now let's go on to fibrous, neural xanthomatous and myxomatous tumors. If you have an orange colored lesion in the plica semilunaris, that bleeds spontaneously. You know, there are very few lesions which bleeds spontaneously. One of which I already mentioned, pyogenic granuloma can bleed spontaneously. This is a second lesion that bleeds spontaneously and it can bleed within it. We also talked about lymphangiectasia, lymphangioma bleeding spontaneously. Well, this is one more lesion, which is but a large solid lesion, which is occupying the entire carankle and slightly beyond it. It has bled within itself. And that orange colored lesion signifies with this apple green pyrifringens, what would be our diagnosis? Conjunctival amyloid. Amyloid. So, conjunctival amyloid is something that can bleed spontaneously. Here is one more example of a conjunctival amyloid. This was a patient with bilateral RGP lens use, but unilateral contact lens intolerance. And when we flipped the lid, she had these lesions, which are translucent pink. And as soon as we averted the lid, you can see streams of blood within uh, uh, you know, in the middle of these uh, lobulated lesion. And that was very clearly a conjunctival amyloid of the palpebral conjunctiva. Now, what if you have a patient of this sort where the lesion is pinkish, but disproportionately extremely vascular with some amount of bleeding within it? If you think that this is, it's a lymphoproliferative lesion, you may be right, but it has exuberant vascularity, which is disproportionate to a lymphoproliferative lesion. Of course, this is from the literature, not my own case. And what if a patient, the same patient has this as well, pigmentation of the mucocutaneous junction? What do you suspect? Do you think it is dangerous? Of course, it is dangerous because it is conjunctival myxoma. Now, conjunctival myxoma is extremely rare, but it is part of Carney's complex, a hereditary cancer syndrome. These patients have spotty mucocutaneous pigmentation and myxoma of the various tissues, including the heart and also uh, other organs. So it, it also goes by two other syndromes, name, NEMI, atrial myxoma, myxoid neurofibroma, and FLIDIS syndrome, or LAM syndrome, lentiginous atrial myxoma, and blue NEMI syndrome. So these are the same names given to the uh, same syndrome. Carney's complex, name, or LAM are the same uh, disease spectrum which go by different names. But what should, you should be aware of is that if you have a patient with a fleshy looking conjunctival lesion with disproportionately excessive vascularity, look at the patient's lip. That's the easiest mucocutaneous junction that you can inspect 
as, as part of ophthalmology and if your facial examination and you'll suddenly pick up the diagnosis that it is indeed a conjunctival myxoma that you're looking at not anything else not a lymphoproliferative lesion so you should be very careful when you have disproportionate vascularity in a conjunctival lesion now how does this differ from the previous case this is also a fleshy conjunctival stromal lesion not an epithelial lesion with excessive vascularity and this is called conjunctival stromal tumor so cost and myxoma are almost the same family but there is a difference and this uh, diagnostic tree differentiates one from the other myxoma and cost age is one criteria and also there is a genetic mutation that is underlying each of these entities now going on to lymphoid tumors we have only three lesions that fit into this category one is the marching disorders which means that one can progress to another so not in the reverse way but a benign reactive lymphoid hyperplasia can progress to atypical lymphoid hyperplasia which can progress to lymphoma now um, once you see these patients you appreciate them as salmon pink lesions fleshy conjunctival lesions with not so much of vascularity but when you look at these blood vessels very carefully on slit lamp again you will find this corkscrew kind of an architecture blood vessels appearing from nowhere and disappearing from nowhere disappearing nowhere like the filament of a tungsten bulb you know they just pop up like that and disappear somewhere without showing up contiguity sometimes and that's very typical of conjunctival lymphoma or lymphoproliferative lesion looking at these irrespective of the size in fact this is much larger i show you four of these here each of each of these is of a different size you cannot ever predict which one is a benign reactive lymphoid hyperplasia which one is atypical lymphoid hyperplasia and which one is lymphoma unless you biopsy it so clinical diagnosis is not possible between these three entities you can call them clinically as a lymphoproliferative lesion but you have to do histopathology and immunohistochemistry to confirm if it is really benign or atypical or is lymphoma because treatment is totally different so if it is brlh and atypical you can opt to treat them with steroids whereas if it's lymphoma then obviously these patients would need systemic evaluation and uh, deep management going on to uh, management itself now ocular to surface tumors have a high rate of local tumor recurrence and recurrent tumors can infiltrate deeper can produce regional lymph node metastasis and if it's melanoma of course it can produce systemic metastasis so it can have implications on vision eye salvage and life that's why your management strategy has to be very clear oncological principles in conjunctival tumor management would be number one accurate diagnosis so the entire last week we spoke about ways to make your diagnosis more and more accurate so unless you have an accurate diagnosis you may err on the uh, side of management you may be suboptimal or you may be extra cautious resulting in over management resulting again in functional deficit to the patient or you may have under managed the patient resulting in a high chance of local tumor recurrence the second is objective assessment of the extent of the tumor now by extent i mean the horizontal extent and also the depth of the lesion unless you're sure of the entire horizontal extent of the lesion and the depth of the lesion your surgical excision is going to be suboptimal because you may leave some edge that is uh, residual with the tumor or you may have some base that is residual with the tumor in certain situations you may have to start the patient on new adjuvant therapy new adjuvant therapy means that your final management would of course be surgery or some form of definitive management maybe radiotherapy but before that you would like to shrink down the tumor or reduce its extent so that you can conserve the eye and the function of the eye the next goal in oncology is margin as well as base clearance when you excise a particular tumor the margin the horizontal extent has to be entirely clear of the tumor and the base has to be free of tumor and that can be judged only on histopathology and if any of that is positive or if you find other risk factors that mean that the patient may have a higher chance of local tumor recurrence then you have to initiate appropriate adjuvant therapy so unless you follow this route to oncological management of a conjunctival neoplasia then you may have a higher chance of local tumor recurrence now uh, surgical excision is considered definitely the standard of care nothing has replaced surgical excision in the management of 
conjunctival tumors. Plaque brachytherapy is popping in. It is coming in as a secondary form of treatment or even a primary form of treatment in many conjunctival malignancies, which are potentially surgically unresectable or incompletely resectable. Now, for patients who have intraocular extension or orbital extension, you have extended enucleation or orbital excentration. What is emerging is topical treatment. Now, topical treatment can be given in three forms. One is topical chemotherapy. The second is topical interferon alpha 2b, which is topical immunotherapy. And the third is a very rarely used medication, Hidoflovir, for specifically for HPV-mediated OSSN in HIV-positive individuals. Topical therapy can be used as primary treatment. That means that before giving any other form of treatment, just after having diagnosed it, you use topical therapy. That's called primary treatment. It can be given as neoadjuvant treatment. That is, before a definitive surgery, you reduce the tumor like you do in retinoblastoma, you shrink the tumor by giving chemotherapy. Here also you can shrink the tumor by giving topical chemotherapy or immunotherapy before you perform surgery. Then you can give it as adjuvant therapy as well. The fourth form of treatment would be immunomodulation where you give this to enhance the immune system that is possible only with topical interferon alpha 2b. So when you consider topical interferon alpha 2b, you have immunotherapy, immunoreduction, and immunomodulation. These are, these are the terms that are to be used. Topical interferon alpha 2b is to be used in 1 million international units four times a day without any gap between the drug schedules continuously for up to 12 months. And, and uh, after tumor clinically resolves, you will have to continue to use it for at least four to six weeks so that there is no rebound. Whereas topical chemotherapy is used in cycles. Now, mitomycin C and 5-fluoroviracil are the other forms of topical therapy. Mitomycin C is used in 0.02 to 0.04% or 0.2 mg per ml or 0.4 mg per ml. That is the dose that is used. Mitomycin is typically used in the rule of 4. 4, that is 0.04%, 4 times a day, 4 days a week, for 4 weeks. That is one cycle. That means that you give it on say Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday and not give it on Friday, Saturday, Sunday and the patient starts again back on Monday and so on and so forth. So four times a day, four days a week for four weeks. That's one protocol. The second protocol is one week on and one week off. 5 fluorouracil is used as 1% drop four times a day, one week on and one week off. That is how it is used. There is a gap between continuous use of these medications only to make sure that the corneal epithelium recovers adequately before you start the next pulse. There is no other reason except giving some rest to the epithelium rather than continuously use these drugs and cause uh, recurrent or chronic epithelial problems. Now, this is one example where topical therapy has been very useful. That is corneal ocular surface chemist neoplasia. This is the point where my cornea specialist had taken a biopsy from and that's exactly the point where there is a residual corneal scar after the entire tumor has been otherwise taken care of by topical therapy which means that if you were to attempt primary surgery, possibly there would be some scar in the pupillary axis, the split loading good patient. So topical therapy is typically used in corneal OSS and patients of this sort do very well with topical therapy. Second indication would be a small tumor. If you have a tumor which is just about one to two clock hours in extent, then there is nothing better than topical therapy, especially if the tumor is flatter or placoid. If a tumor is very highly elevated like this, a nodular tumor, even if it's a couple of clock hours, you would want to excise it because they take a long time to respond to topical therapy or don't respond at all. So flat, small tumors are the best indications for topical therapy. Next indication would be a tumor which is occupying more than six clock hours of the lipus because OSSN is a tumor of the limbal stem cells. If you excise six clock hours of the limbus, there's a higher chance of limbal stem cell deficiency. To prevent that and to have a scarless healing without any conjunctivalization at all, if you have a flatter tumor like this, you can definitely use topical therapy to your great advantage. This patient has had complete tumor control after about three months of treatment without any scar at all. Next indication would be a diffuse tumor. Diffuse tumor is when the tumor is like a carpet spreading over the ocular surface without much of elevation at all, but very extensive in its horizontal extent. This patient has about 9 clock hours of limbal involvement, and about 75% of the vulva conjunctiva is involved already. 
and it goes away like magic in about three months of treatment. So larger the tumor, larger the extent of the tumor, longer is the treatment that is required. But definitely all these patients have a very high chance of tumor going away completely, about 90% success with topical interferon. There are cases that can rebound. That means that after stopping topical interferon, there may be some islands of tumor that may recur. That's only because uh, you may have failed to recognize complete treatment. There might be some very subtle clinical residual which may not have, which you may not have picked up clinically on slit lamp evaluation. So it's always a good idea to perform rose bengal staining on the ocular surface to detect very subtle clinical residuals and continue topical interferon at least six weeks following complete resolution, clinical resolution of the tumor. You can also take the help of OCT if you wish, but nothing like a good slit lamp clinical evaluation aided by staining to detect if the complete tumor has gone away or not. So it's very important to recognize the end point of treatment. Otherwise, you may end up having local tumor recurrences. Next indication would be a tumor in a critical situation like this. This patient is a patient with zero derma pigmentosum. This is his third graph. Prior two grafts have failed, other eye is blind, and unfortunately, he has developed a tumor at the graft host junction, a fairly large tumor at the graft host junction, obscuring the sutures, and he also has some DM folds already. So, if you were to try to surgically excise it, then you may tip the graft in favor of either graft rejection or failure. And remember, this is precious graft, and the other eye already is blind. So, in such situations, you can use topical interferon to your advantage. Tumor goes away completely without a scar and the graft is saved as well. So this is one more special indication for topical interferon. I would definitely not use mitomycin or 5-FU in this patient because we want to be very gentle on the cornea and hence topical interferon. Now, if you have a much larger tumor, then you can't uh, rely on topical therapy at all. This patient is a very typical candidate for orbital excentration because his palpebral as well as bulba conjunctiva are both involved. But vision is fine and the patient is keen on eye salvage, other eye has suboptimal vision, then you can inject interferon. This is subconjunctival perilegional injection of multiple doses of injection interferon. You can use 3 to 10 million international units every three weekly for about six injections, after which sustained topical interferon therapy and maybe a couple of sessions of cryotherapy for refractory residual lesions and the patient has his eyes saved. So about 50% of eyes can be saved with this kind of aggressive treatment. Not all of them and some of them do come to orbital excentration ultimately. This is one more patient with HIV zero positivity where the entire ocular surface was involved with OSSN and he got complete salvage by injection interferon. Now immunoreduction is a principle where the tumor can be reduced as I said. And how does that happen? Suppose this is the cornea that's the pupil. Oasisin is a tumor of the limbal stem cell. So epicenter, you can safely assume, will be at the limbus. And generally at the epicenter is invasive OSSN and that is surrounded by a zone of carcinoma in situ and severe, moderate and mild dysplasia. Ocular surface chemist neoplasia is nothing but a spectrum of diseases ranging from mild dysplasia to invasive squamous cell carcinoma. Now, immunoreduction actually takes away mild moderate and severe dysplasia and carcinoma in situ. So all these areas will go away with topical therapy. And what may be left is a spot of tumor that is the epicenter of the tumor or around the epicenter where there is a component of invasive squamous cell carcinoma. So finally, when you excise it, you only excise this. Rest of the areas can be left intact, thus reducing morbidity to the patient, conjunctival scarring, etc. So your form of surgery will be much definitive, much smaller, much morbid if you were to employ immunoreduction to your advantage. So if you have any flatter placoid lesion, you can always challenge these patients with topical interferon and whatever that is residual, you can upfront counsel the patient that it may come to surgical excision. And that's a fair deal because you are trying your best with topical therapy and whatever that is residual can be excised but by a much smaller surgery than what you could have had to do initially. Now, immunomodulation is a very special concept. In patients who have a higher chance of local tumor recurrence, such as patients with zero derma pigmentosum, have young individuals with multifocal tumors coming back with new tumors, often not, or patients with iatrogenic immunosuppression for organ transplantation, or patients with HIV seropositivity, all of them have chance of local tumor recurrence, and many of them are modulated by H human papillomavirus infection. There we use 
immunomodulation as a one-sided therapy. The advantages and disadvantages of topical therapy are given here. Topical therapy is non-invasive, has a much reduced incidence of limbal stem cell deficiency, produces scarless healing because there is no visible scar at the end of topical therapy. But the disadvantage is that it lacks micro surgical, uh, sorry, uh, so lack of microsurgical skill is not a limitation to treat. The disadvantage is that there is no histopathological evidence that you have before you start treatment. So you may have uh, patients who are refractory to treatment because your diagnosis has been wrong. Compliance issues are definitely there. If a patient does not comply using uh, anti-glaucoma medications, you can't assume that the patient will comply with uh, topical therapy for uh, ocular surface tumors. And patients have to be committed to long-term treatment and follow-up. And added to all these follow-ups and the cost of the medication, it makes it expensive. So if you want uh, economical one-time treatment, that definitely is surgery. But if you want to have non-surgical interventions, that is possible in a compliant patient. So we should also understand when not to offer topical therapy. Definitely when the diagnosis is in doubt. If you're not sure of the diagnosis, like a patient of this sort where there is uh, unilateral red eye, this case I was showing you earlier, with ocular surface looking like OSSN, but lids tell a different tale, sebaceous gland carcinoma, vegetoid variant, obviously topical therapy will not work. Patient like this, amelanotic tumor, but you can see the conjunctiva is shining on top. So it is not an epithelial tumor, it is a stromal tumor. This was an amelanotic melanoma, no way topical therapy is going to work. So whenever conjunctiva shines on top of a tumor, I would definitely not perform topical therapy because I know upfront that it is a stromal tumor. Even if it is squamous cell carcinoma, then it is going to be a mucoepidermic variant of squamous cell carcinoma, which will not work with topical therapy at all. So whenever conjunctiva shines on top of a tumor, I'd be very careful not to use topical therapy. If you have any doubt at all, you can use this diagnostic triad or anterior segment OC to confirm the diagnosis. The second um, contraindication is when you're not sure about the depth at all. If you are sure about the depth by imaging, slit lamp evaluation, then you can go ahead with topical therapy. But when a patient is like this, where there is exuberant keratin on top of the lesion, causing shadowing artifact, you're not sure about the depth. You cannot use topical therapy reliably. Patient of this sort definitely is not a candidate for topical therapy because his corneal stroma is full thickness involved. He'll never resolve with topical therapy. Next is when you're not sure about the stage. Sometimes we read abstracts and venture on to treat. This particular abstract of a very well done study has generalized that it can uh, see you can see that uh, tumor control can be achieved in 85% of T3. Now, if you know what is T3, that's fine. If you don't know, I'm going to tell you what is T3. T3 is tumor that invades adjacent structures, excluding the orbit. So, T3 includes invasion of the cornea, intraocular structures, fornicial conjunctiva, palpable conjunctiva, tarsal conjunctiva, puncta, canaliculi, carenchyl, anterior and posterior eyelid like the lamella or eyelid margin. Do you think 85% of these patients respond well, you may have had a couple of cases in that series which may have responded, which may have come to 85%. That doesn't mean that these patients will respond in a generalized way. So you should never read the abstract and start treating these patients based on the uh, assumption that these patients will respond. You should always go through the entire manuscript and then derive your conclusion. This patient was started on topical therapy by a uh, uh, cornea specialist believing that this is T3 and it will work, you can see within weeks that the tumor has actually increased in size. This patient has scleral invasion, lateral fornicial involvement. There's no way he can respond to topical therapy at all. When you're not sure of patient compliance, again, you should not use topical therapy. Patient of this sort with a nodular lesion, which is fairly elevated, patient coming from a rural background may not be able to come back for follow-up easily. Then you should do primary surgery as the treatment of choice. You should never use topical therapy by guess alone. There are ophthalmologists who call after excising a particular tumor that do I start this patient on topical mitomycin? For what reason? The reason should always be based on histopathology. So if you have a patient with resection edge positive and that has only dysplasia and carcinoma in situ, if you are done edge cryotherapy, there is no reason to worry at all. You can observe these patients. If you're not done edge cryotherapy, then you can use topical chemotherapy or interferon. If resection edge is positive and that has invasive squamous cell carcinoma, 
then medical legally you are bound to re-excise it because we know that invasive squamous cell carcinoma does not respond to topical therapy. If resection base is positive and pathology tells you that it is localized and if you are sure that it is say at a particular clock hour, 3, 4 or 5 clock hour, then you can easily go ahead to that particular clock hour and do cryotherapy and that is acceptable. If resection base is positive and that is diffusely positive, then you have no alternative but to perform plaque brachytherapy because diffuse base positivity cannot respond to anything else. If a patient is prone to recurrence because of a histopathological or systemic profile, then you do immunomodulation. So this is this table sum, summary summarizes the accepted adjuvant therapy, which is histopathology guided. So adjuvant therapy has always to be histopathology guided. Now, uh, about surgery. Now, excision with tumor-free margins is the principle of surgery in ocular surface chemist neoplasia or in conjunctival melanoma. For the corneal epithelial component, use what is called alcohol-assisted keratoepitheliectomy. Lamellar keratectomy and lamellar sclerectomy are reserved for difficult situations where there is corneal stromal invasion or scleral lamellar invasion where you don't have plaque brachytherapy or access to plaque brachytherapy. Cryotherapy to resection edge is a part of the treatment. So excision with tumor-free margins, alcohol-assisted keratoepitheliectomy and cryotherapy to resection edge are all parts of the same surgery. Cryotherapy to resection base is done in special situation where you find that one part of the base is going slightly deeper and you have a clinical suspicion already during surgery that the base may come positive in that area. Then you do a precautionary resection based cryotherapy and wait for the pathologist to confirm if that area is indeed involved. Sometimes you have to make a large diagram, not a uh, you know, pinhead size diagram that I often see in the medical records by my own fellows, where nothing is seen except the eyelids or the surface of the eye. We have to detail the tumor because we are in the business of ocular oncology and we have to take our business very seriously if you really want to be sure that the patient benefits. It's not for the purpose of filling the file that you draw diagrams. It's for taking care of the patient overall that you have to be very detailed with your diagrams. If a patient deserves such a diagram, if a patient has a small tumor, all the margins of which are seen, then that is okay. That is acceptable to get away with a smaller diagram. But if a patient has a complex recurrent disease or a disease that needs to be mapped well and treated with a lot of seriousness, then you have to map out the lesion yourself. And that's very important because once you give peribulbar block, sometimes some of these subtle areas may get obscured and you may forget. You may have seen the patient a week ago and how can you easily remember where all the tumor was. So unless you have a diagram and everything marked up, it's in your interest that you start drawing these diagrams and labeling them without spending much time, not hours together. All these can be drawn in a couple of minutes and that can easily be done with some practice. That's about the margin. And margin has to be drawn always after staining with, with uh, staining the lesion with rose bengal. The lateral most or the medial most margin that stains is taken as the definitive margin, not what you see on slit lamp. Of course, you see gross margin on slit lamp, but the subtle subclinical margin can be stained, and that is how you mark the margins. Then the base has to be judged by using imaging. So once you have done the judgment of the margin and the base, then you will take the patient for surgery. This video clip shows the procedure of surgery where Beyond the clinically detectable edge of the lesion, you mark 4 millimeter. Where you mark can be different. You can use a bipolar cautery as I'm using, or you can use ink, you can use gentian violet, your choice. The surgical instrument is also your choice. Here I'm using monopolar RF electrode, which I feel very comfortable with because I'm an octoplasty surgeon by training background, but you can definitely use scissors and blade. It's your choice. But the idea is to go dissect the tumor off the base with minimal damage to the base. Then you stop for a while and cryo all the feeding vessels from the base. Dry the cornea and apply absolute alcohol to the leading edge of the tumor, at least three to four millimeter beyond the edge of the tumor for about 50 to 20 seconds till the epithelium turns subtle gray. Then you take a crescent knife and scroll off the corneal epithelium towards the limbus. So you have to reach the limbus from the conjunctival side and you have to also reach the limbus from the corneal side. Finally, you have to resect the tumor of the limbus because OSSN is a tumor of the limbal stem cells. So final resection is always at the limbus. We've reached the limbus from the corneal side. We have already reached the limbus from the conjunctival side. The next step is to lift one edge of the tumor. Visualize it very carefully. Visualize where you are cutting and you can use a wet technique or a dry technique. Really doesn't matter. Some surgeon very firmly believe that we have to use a dry technique. 
but wet is okay as long as uh, you can see the tumor. If you want to use the dry technique, the bed will be anyway wet with blood. So that way your vision is still obscured. Then you do what is called edge cryotherapy, where you drape the edge of the conjunctiva onto the tip of a three millimeter cryoprobe and freeze it till the freeze reaches the anterior surface of the conjunctiva. This is reverse cryotherapy. You don't start from the anterior surface and go posterior. Start from the posterior surface and come anterior where your endpoint is visible. That's base cryotherapy where if you suspect that the tumor is slightly deeper at one clock hour or two clock hours, you can easily cryo the base primarily so that even if histopathology comes positive for that particular clock hour for base involvement, you've already done the job. You don't have to take the patient back to the OR or consider any other form of treatment. Repair is your choice. You can use conjunctival autograph. You can use amniotic membrane, suture it, use autologous blood, whatever you want to use, but make sure that the entire area of excision and the deepithelized cornea is covered so that there is no issue with healing and there is no conjunctivalization and epithelium is heals fairly quickly. Surgical results are fairly good, fairly accurate. You can see limbal stem cell deficiency not being there even if the lesion is about 6 to 7 clock hours. And for a much larger lesion, you can use primary simple limbal epithelial transplantation. Now, this is a patient with conjunctival melanoma excised exactly with the same technique. So, whether it is melanoma or ocular surface dermis neoplasia, principle of surgery nearly remains the same. Melanoma does not involve corneal epithelium so much. So, you may skip the step of alcohol-assisted keratoepithelectomy. But otherwise, 4 millimeter margins, base uh, clearance, excision edge clearance, everything remains the same. This is a patient with diffuse conjunctival melanoma excised exactly by the same technique. You have to excise each spot of pigmentation that you see. And make sure that every spot is removed completely. Adjuvant therapy I already spoke about. One video for uh, uh, dermolipoma. This is a benign lesion. Not all conjunctival lesions are malignant. This dermolipoma I was talking about, a way to excise it is to make a crescentric incision in the, sorry, I think I can go over. Yeah. Now, localize the area where conjunctiva is adherent to the dermolipoma. So, you pinch it with a forceps and find out area where the conjunctiva is adherent to dermolipoma and make your incision right in that area. It is bound to be, at, now I'm lifting the conjunctiva, you can see that at the edge, which is confluent with the conjunctiva, I'm making my incision. It's a curvilinear incision and it always gets hidden under the upper eyelid. Your dissection is typically subconjunctival, not subtenance. This is anterior to the tenance always because dermolipoma is always anterior to the tenance. Again, subconjunctival dissection that is being taken place. So you always lift the lesion with your forceps to get the nice plane pre-tenance and march towards the lateral fornix because dermolipoma always perforates the tenons at the lateral canthus and gets into the anterior orbit. That narrow neck, when it truncates into a narrow neck get to get into the orbit, that is where you decapitate it and rest of it can retract back into the orbit, but you should have cryoed the edge before it retracts back into the orbit or use monopolar electrode like I'm using. So that there is no secondary bleeding. That is the end of excision. So the rough edges of the conjunctiva can now be very conservatively removed so that the patient gets the cosmesis that she wants, a plain conjunctival surface. Then if the conjunctiva is adequate, you can simply primarily close it with glue or if it's a, a small defect is there, then you can use a small amniotic membrane graft or conjunctival autograft to cover that area so that epithelization is fairly uh, quick and uh, scar is minimal. So that's how I glue the defect in the conjunctiva. And about four to six weeks later, a patient can look like this without any stigma of prior surgery, lacrimal gland well protected and lacrimal protectors never seen during surgery. Now for other advanced cases, we have brachytherapy and external beam radiation. For patients who have scleral invasion or intraocular extension, the only form of treatment that was available earlier was extended enucleation. Now we have brachytherapy. If you have access to it, it is very good. It's highly successful. So this is an example of a patient where there is scleral invasion. And these are the exact patients who would benefit by brachytherapy. Now sclera that you see is white. That doesn't mean anything. Sclera hardly ever melts following brachytherapy. This white sclera is avascular, no doubt, but it is tectonically stable. Even if it is slightly thin, it is nice and stable. It does not cause ectasia or staphyloma. So you have a very stable 
sclera following brachytherapy. This is a patient where there is nearly full thickness scleral involvement and you can see nice sclera following brachytherapy. One more example of brachytherapy following conjunctival tumor excision, base positivity. So brachytherapy is done in two ways. One is secondary brachytherapy where you excise the tumor, send it away for histopathology. Pathologist takes a while to confirm that it is indeed a tumor that you are clinically diagnosed and also that the base is positive. So when the pathologist tells you that base is positive, then you come back again to do brachytherapy, that is secondary black brachytherapy. But you already know clinically that the base is positive, then you can do primary brachytherapy as well. At the time of excision itself, you can do brachytherapy. And if you have any doubt at all, you can do frozen section uh, diagnosis and then do brachytherapy on the table itself. Waiting for a while always has a problem that the conjunctiva may get foreshortened, the phonation may uh, foreshortening may occur, thus precluding placement of adequately sized plug without opening the phonics again. So primary brachytherapy is preferable. These patients have all undergone secondary brachytherapy earlier. This is one example of a recent primary brachytherapy where the stroma was already melted. So we did not even excise the complete tumor. We excised what was only safe, got the diagnosis on the table and applied plaque right on top of the tumor on the table. And six weeks later, you can see nice regression. One more example of primary brachytherapy. So plaque can be used primarily as well as secondarily. In a melanoma situation, only for the scleral component. This nodular melanoma is nothing to worry about. It does not have scleral component, but this portion had scleral component and that is where plaque was used with good success. What about patients who have intraocular extension? Now, this is a patient who is a young individual, has had multiple surgeries earlier elsewhere. His vision is... Uh, was good until a point of time that he developed retinal detachment. So he has potential vision, but now he has a retinal detachment and an intraocular extension, and he is not at all convinced about losing his eye. So here in such situations, brachytherapy may not work well because there is no place to place the plaque, no uh, kind of accessible area at all. His eye is isotropic, his medial rectus is very tight, and he has intraocular extension. And that's the fundus that you're looking at with choroidal detachment and retinal detachment. So here our oncologist designed a nice uh, kind of conformal radiation technique. This is a linear accelerator uh, based radiation technique, stereotactic radiation, that is what we call it. And following treatment, you can see that the RD has settled, choroidal detachment has settled, and the tumor has completely regressed, as you can note by ultrasound B scan and also UBM the ciliary body extension and choroidal extension have all gone. So there is a scope for saving some of these patients with uh, stereotactic radiation with uh, chemosensitization. So this patient received intravenous 5-fluoroiracil concurrently with radiation and he did very well. Now other forms of therapy happen to be uh, vaporization. Now tumor can be vaporized either by using carbon dioxide laser or an RF electrode. These are some of the examples of patients who have undergone vaporization. Extremely vascular lesions. This patient I showed you earlier also. One of my colleagues had attempted a biopsy here and it had bled uh, very much. So he had abandoned the surgery and had finally referred the patient for possible bleomycy. Now this patient has tumor all around his inferior rectus, medial rectus, inferior oblique, lateral rectus, and it is extending so close to the cornea. So bleomycin is definitely a possibility, but you should worry about causing muscle fibrosis, corneal epithelial toxicity, etc. In orbit, it is okay, but we have limited experience of using bleomycin for extensive conjunctival lesions because it has it does have some complications. So in a situation of this sort, surgery can be an option, bleomycin can be an option, pisibanil can be an option, but vaporization is also a definite option where you vaporize layer by layer of the tumor and the raw area is always covered with amniotic membrane. It surfaces very well, as you see here, six weeks later, there's no trace of the tumor and the ocular surface is all well maintained. This is a patient with extensive conjunctival lymphangioma and the entire ocular surface being involved. So we did stage vaporization here. We did it in two or three stages uh, probably. And at the end of treatment, all that is left is some conjunctival scarring that needs to be excised and resurfaced. But you can see the difference. This is how we started off with and this is how we ended with. So there's a lot of difference in the ocular surface now without any residual lymphangioma, without surgery at all. Last bit is about the role of target therapy. Now, target therapy can be used in two forms. One is local injections. Local injections can be used in patients with lymphoma. This is a patient with conjunctival lymphoma. 
he has a fairly large superior facial component it was confirmed to be case of mart lymphoma but incidentally he has a small sliver of tumor extending all along the surface of the eyeball back beyond the equator of the eye now for the posterior component which is running between the eyeball and the superior rectus lps complex you cannot chase the tumor and get it out without causing functional issues so such patients typically receive low dose radiation but if you want to avoid radiation then you can give perilesional injection rituximab this is a localized form of target therapy targets the tumor itself does not have any side effect periocularly does not cause fibrosis etc six injections three weekly apart what was required for this patient to get rid of his residual tumor now for melanoma we definitely have lot of target therapeutic agents some of these are now appearing in india although with lot of expense now with each mutation there is a set of drugs that uh, are prescribed for example anti pd1 we have nivolumab and pembrolizumab anti pd l1 we have uh, atezolumab and evolumab there are a lot of drugs that have uh, started coming up in the literature and in clinical use for specifically for conjunctival melanoma some of these case reports are appearing in the literature this was a patient with extraocular extension of uh, melanoma that was treated with pembrolizumab now this is a series of patients that were treated with nivolumab this one patient of mine who had regional lymph node metastasis for which he was uh, approved for use of nivolumab 3 months later his conjunctival recurrence following pam that he had is completely gone so he did not need any surgery for his conjunctival lesion at all because that went away with uh, systemic nivolumab so in conclusion i would say that conjunctival tumor last class and this as you saw have a very wide spectrum diagnosis is typically clinical these lesions are very typical they all come with a signature they are staring at you begging for a diagnosis if you don't diagnose these then it's your fault because they are there out for you to diagnose they are looking at you staring at you actually if you look at them very clinic very critically on a clinical evaluation and on slit lamp and you do anterior segmental aging then nearly 100% of them can be easily clinically diagnosed maybe some with differential diagnosis but most of them without any differential diagnosis a definitive diagnosis that can be corroborated on histopathology can be easily made surgery continues to be the standard of care but then topical therapy has taken over surgery in many situations but has specific indications you should never step beyond un the safe zones for topical therapy i already mentioned as to when topical therapy should not be used and that has to be contraindications have to be taken more seriously than the indications for topical therapy so there is a limit to topical therapy and you should use it within that limit and make sure that the patient is compliant surgery definitely has very good success but there are patients who are beyond surgery where uh, brachytherapy if you have access to it is excellent for limited intraocular extension scleral invasion brachytherapy works like magic with 90% success systemic immunotherapy is promising and so are target therapeutic agents thank you so much if you have any questions i'll be happy to take thank you so much sir for uh, uh, elaborating on the management i'm sure that many of the centers do not have these facilities as ocular oncology is a rare entity in general so uh, giving an overview to the post graduates is quite helpful i hope it helps everyone out there are few questions that uh, i have come over the social portals for you uh, one of the questions is that uh, what is the end point of using uh, injection interferon and would you uh, proceed with doing a map biopsy after that end point as well no there is no end point to use injection interferon finally you want complete tumor control and with injection interferon alone complete tumor control is very rare so injection interferon is always a starting point for you to start off on topical therapy at some point in time i would use six injections of injection interferon if at all um, you know if i start it off every 3 to 4 weekly and at the end of it i would continue with topical therapy till complete tumor regression happens what is the okay, second sir. part of the question sorry sir second part of the question map biopsy so second part map biopsy right map biopsy is not indicated unless you're not sure clinically of local tumor recurrence sometimes there could be a net mixture of dissolved areas and scar or even inflammation which could be confusing mm-hmm. so if there is a confusing clinical situation then you can do map biopsy if it's completely resolved clinically 
then there is no indication for map errors. Right, sir. So another question is that uh, if there is base positivity and in centers where plug brachytherapy is not available, how uh, would you proceed with topical chemotherapy and for how long? Topical therapy will not work for base positivity, so there is no point trying it. It is, in fact, contraindicated. You have to send the patient to uh, facilities where brachytherapy is available. There are centers which do brachytherapy all across the country. So you can definitely find a center where such a facility is available and send off the patient. Nothing short of brachytherapy works for base positivity. Right, sir. So another question is that how much does nivolumumab uh, cost and do we have the availability in India? The drug is definitely available. It is imported uh, specific to a patient. Company supplies it. And the cost is very expensive. It costs de depending on the uh, agreement that the uh, hospital has with the company. It may range from 60,000 per month to 3 lakhs per month. Right, so, uh, so another question is that, uh, and correct me, Ayush, if I'm wrong uh, in reframing the question. Uh, the question is that could we have done lamellar sclerectomy over plaque brachytherapy in the case of melanoma, which was flat but localized? Is that what you mean, Ayush? Is that do you mean that you would prefer to do lamellar sclerectomy instead? Uh, yes, uh, the question is correctly framed. Uh, in the picture which uh, Sir showed where there was a nodular melanoma and a flat uh, localized melanoma. So is there an, any indication where we could have done lamellar sclerectomy over plaque brachytherapy? One can be when it is not available. And is there any other indication? That's a shortcut. Lamellar sclerectomy, how, how deep would you go? You cannot judge lamellar sclerectomy depth by doing frozen section, etc. So in melanoma, the deeper you go, the better, but that means that you have resected full section of the sclera. So um, the only safest way to make sure that the entire sclera is treated and without any tectonic damage to the sclera is bracket therapy. So if there is scleral invasion already, I wouldn't uh, even attempt lamellar sclerectomy because I know that it's going to be suboptimal. Thank you. Uh, and so there was another request for explain, explaining the immunomodulation component again. Immunomodulation is a concept where it is believed, it's not proven, that if you use topical interferon on a daily basis for an extended period of time, that is unlimited period, then the chance of local tumor recurrence or new tumors developing in a predisposed patient, which means that the patient is either syndromically predisposed because of xeroderma pigmentosum, which is based on DNA repair mechanism, or patient is syndromically predisposed in palmoplantar keratoderma because of a different mechanism, or predisposed because of their immune status, such as patients with HIV seropositivity, post-organ transplantation immunosuppression, patients on chronic corticosteroids, etc., local immunosuppression or systemic immunosuppression, or patient who has a HIV HPV mediated OSSN, then you can use once a day dose of topical interferon for an unlimited period of time to prevent local tumor recurrence or new tumors popping up. That's the concept. It's not proven yet because there is no center that has accumulated matching clinical data. So there's no formal study done as such. But we have all seen that when these patients are started on maintenance dose of interferon, there is hardly any local tumor recurrence. Right, sir. Uh, so another question is that in case of diffuse OSSN, uh, where do you exactly inject the interferon and uh, practically do we inject it at multiple places at the same setting, in the same setting? You can inject from one point. The idea is not to deliver it to the tumor directly. The idea is to create a depot in that area, a high concentration, which can remain for a few hours or a day or two in enough concentration so that there is a bolus of interferon that is provided to the tumor and most of the cytodestruction can occur at that point in time. So it's not that you should go ahead and inject even if it is not injectable. For example, if a tumor is fixed to the base, there's no way you can inject under it. You cannot inject within the lesion. It's a wrong term to call it in intralesional. It is actually perilesional because you cannot inject within a tumor because the lesion is friable. It will not hold any drug within it. 
what can hold drug is the perilesional area which is normal conjunctiva or scarred conjunctiva so it is perilesional injection and you can definitely inject in multiple points because you have about a cc of drug it's 3 or 5 or 10 million international units per ml that you inject so you have one cc of drug to inject and how much ever area that it takes for you to inject you have to inject by multiple entries i would make one entry in a area where i would estimate one cc of drug can easily go in and i would inject in that area right so uh so another question is that how often do you see 360 degree uh, ossn or melanomas or ring melanomas and what is your uh, uh, management protocol for the same management is the same 360 degree 180 degree really doesn't matter only problem would be that if it is 360 degree limbus then chance of limbal stem cell deficiency would be higher so you would possibly do a primary slit if you are dealing with ossn or if it's a flattish tumor then you for oss and you definitely want to treat with topical therapy first and then for residual you might want to do surgery for melanomas definitely no topical therapy works so direct surgery but with slit right so so in the patients where you have more than four uh, uh, quadrants of involvement at the limbus what are the counseling pointers that you keep in mind pre operatively for the patients which one melanoma or uh, oss oss is there is nothing special that you tell about uh, you know 360 degree involvement only thing that can go wrong in those patients is unpredictable conjunctivalization of the cornea because how much of limbal cell damage has stem cell damage has happened has happened in those patients sometimes can be unpredictable so if you are end point is to cure the disease then you are uh, going to do an aggressive surgery and in that bargain the patient may develop limbal stem cell deficiency and may not gain much vision so the only thing that i would tell in those patients is that i may have to do a primary slit on the table and the decision depends on how deep the limbus is involved clinically or you can upfront decide that you may want to do a primary slit so that is the only point of discussion otherwise recurrence wise it really doesn't matter how small the tumor is how large the tumor is as long as you got all the edges in the base negative right so uh so there's a question by dr swati and she says that is there any way of assessing depth of scleral invasion other than ubm no ubm and asoct are the only two means where we can assess the depth of the lesion otherwise not possible full thickness of course you can know like we are discussing last time if full thickness sclera is involved or intraocular extension is present there are specific signs that we discussed last time right so so there is a question by dr shagupta uh, she has asked that uh, do we prefer pembrolizumab for melanoma mostly i think it's based on the slide that you have showed right we don't have any preference it's just that if the patient has a particular mutation then you are supposed to use a particular set of drugs depending on their accessibility then you can use it so accessibility and also the cost and what is approved in your country in india right now only nivolumab is approved that too by high end insurance companies not everyone so if your patient fits into that criteria you can use it right so so in your practice uh, how many cycles of uh, uh, topical therapy lead to resolution a clinical resolution a uh, complete clinical resolution and how do you proceed with the follow up thereafter right so there is no cycle in interferon interferon small smaller flatter tumors can resolve the tumor in about 6 weeks following that i would continue to treat the patient for about 6 weeks if it's a larger tumor then interferon would take even up to 5 to 6 months so beyond that you can treat the patient for 6 more weeks for mitomycin the resolution is faster most of the patients who resolve with mitomycin resolve in 3 cycles that means 4 and a half months why is it four and a half months because you follow a rule of four four times a day four days a week for four weeks that's one cycle after that you give a two week gap so one cycle is actually four plus two weeks of which the patient uses the drug only for 16 days so out of 45 days the patient uses the drug only for 16 days and the second cycle starts after 45 days and the third cycle so finally you have about six 
plus six plus six, that is 18 weeks of treatment, four and a half months of treatment. By which time most of the patients who would resolve with mitomycin would have resolved. Why is it not used so commonly is because it really, you know, damages the corneal epithelium and the connector. The chance of patient being very symptomatic during treatment, sometimes requiring abandonment of treatment, temporary stopping of treatment, corneal epithelial erosion, which can be non-healing. Patients are generally very symptomatic. They rub their eye. They are very uncomfortable. So that is the reason why it is not used. So otherwise, it's a good drug. 5-FU is a compromise. It is in between the two. And in 5-FU, one week on, one week off protocol, about three months is what it takes for the tumor to resolve. And beyond that, you would want to treat the patient again for six more weeks. You can switch from one drug to other. If a patient is not responding to topical interferon, you can definitely switch to 5-FU and vice versa. Mitomycin, if it is toxic to the patient, you can switch to interferon. So switching from one drug to another is not a problem. But yeah, this is the duration. So fastest working drug is mitomycin has highest side effect. Intermediate drug is 5-fluoroacyl has intermediate number of side effects. Longest uh, time that it takes for the tumor to resolve is with uh, interferon. And that has this, uh, that has very minimal side effects. So that's it. Right, sir. So thank you for covering the entire spectrum of ocular surface tumors. I think now the postgraduates will see pterygium differently. So I think whenever the case of pterygium pop up, I think they'll land up seeing OSS and in it for sure. So thank you so much, sir, uh, for covering the spectrum of um, uh, surface tumors. And now on 12th, we will be uh, getting into the intraocular tumors and the spectrum thereafter. So we will see you again on Wednesday. The talk is by Dr. Santosh Navasar. So see you all.